We may have been able to beat Halo Reach and Halo 2 without walking, but jumping is a whole nother issue. I mean, in all of the challenges we've done, we've relied on jumping as one of the biggest tools to get through each level. So what would we do if Master Chief got adamant and just really wanted his boots to stay firmly on the ground at all times? Would he be able to finish the fight? With the help of the Arbiter, of course. Well, today we're gonna find out and we're really interested to look at this topic because some of the level design in these Halo levels are built with the expectation that you can jump. So is this something you can actually do? Let's take a look. Starting things off, we're all the way back in Halo 1 on the Pillar of Autumn and in the opening area. Oh no. Right away, we're expected to jump because they're trying to teach you the basic controls of the game and you have to jump over this little section. Luke and I were already stumped off of the get-go and we really tried to walk around and see if there was anything we can do. We thought maybe grenade jumping without pressing the jump button would be something we could do, but we didn't have grenades. So we were really just kind of in a pickle. Is our run dead already? Are we just gonna have to tally up how many jumps are required in the Halo games after literally just a few seconds into the first game? Well, it was looking that way, but what we ended up finding out is that if we walked back into the starting room, we could use this little ramp to gain enough momentum so that I could land on top of Luke's head, and as he crouched slowly walking, I could walk at the same speed, and through this intense balancing act, we were able to navigate back out to the hallway, and I was able to cross over the debris. However, since I didn't have a weapon, I couldn't do anything to force Luke to respawn. So in this case, we just had to part ways and I would go on to complete the fight without him. Not really, after I walked a little further, there was a loading sequence and Luke respawned next to me, but it was a nice thought. Eventually, we did get weapons and we continued through the level. We both missed an assassination attempt on an elite, but Luke even got an achievement for beating a Halo level without jumping. Jumping on to the next level Halo, it was pretty straightforward. There were just some firefights and no parts that required actual jumps in the indoor section. Truth and reconciliation, we had to be careful not to fall off the cliffs in the outdoor section because otherwise you have a long hike to get back up to where you're supposed to go. Throughout this level, we did realize that combat without jumping is a little bit more difficult. You kind of forget how much you take jumping for granted in Halo as a defense mechanism to dodge bullets and get in cover when you can't let yourself jump at all. I mean, just dodging explosions even is kind of scary. Silent Cartographer was up next and this level has ramps literally everywhere. It makes it very easy to navigate. It's one of the most wheelchair friendly levels in the game and no no jumps were required here either. And when we got to assault on the control room, this was one we were a little bit worried about because it's such a long level. There's a ton of elevators, but there's no jumping required on this level either. But 343 Guilty Spark. Oh boy, was this level a fun old time. To start things off, when you're outside, you get to run into this grand old tree situation where you have to cross this tree, but you have to stand on this right branch and get enough momentum to climb up and cross the tree just right. Once you get to the indoor section, however, there's several places where jumps are just expected for you to get through. And this level really tested our patience and actually made us think that this would probably be a run killer. First up, we have this door that we're expected just to jump up onto, and there's really not a lot of options on how to get up there. What we ended up doing was we used this decline where I was able to kind of slide down onto Luke's head and walk forward onto the upper ramp to go through the door. A little later on in the level, there's this place where there's a ton of debris that is on fire. Fortunately, if you inch your way up the debris in a specific pattern, you can actually use the ramp to climb up the debris and make it to the upper level. You just want to be careful not to fall off because doing it over and over again isn't that fun. And then we got to these purple crates and boy was this one a headache. So for this one, we're just expected to jump our way up to the upper level and it's so easily laid out for you, except when you can't jump, getting up this high is really difficult. Essentially, what we ended up doing was just trying to stand next to the crates and kill each other with respawning on and hope that the respawn gods would let us spawn onto the upper crate. And then in that case, we could try to do the next respawn trick for the other player, getting us higher and higher with each respawn. During this time, we also tried other techniques like trying to see if grenades would give us enough of a boost. They don't give you any boost whatsoever, but with enough trial and error, we did finally get up to the second to last jump that we had to get up to. And this is where we had to use a little bit of science to get our way out of this. 
this. Essentially, from us just dying and respawning over and over again, we started to realize that we could manipulate where the other player would respawn in the short period between their death and their respawn if we looked in a specific direction and stood in a place where we would expect them to possibly respawn. And if we could find the right way to block a certain respawn point, instead, the player would spawn on top of the alive player's head. Honestly, this was just something we figured out by just dying a lot and slightly walking and inching and hoping that it was an actual thing that was working. And sure enough, eventually it did work and we were able to get to the top platform, but then we still had to go one more little section that was even higher and slightly further away. So once again, we did the spawn mapping prediction method. From there, he was able to kill me, I was able to respawn on him, and we finally had cleared that section. This was a victory in itself, and we looked over at the pile of dead bodies from our trial and error and thought that it was both interesting and disappointing that we had spent that much time. But out of celebration, we did throw a grenade to trigger a train reaction of all of our dead bodies. It was kind of like fireworks. However, as we progressed through the level, we found even more boxes that were on fire that we would have to jump on. Fortunately enough, we did the respawn trick and it got Luke onto my head and up to the upper platform relatively easily. But then we were faced with another jump that was even higher and looking at it, we weren't sure if the respawn trick would even work here. This time it took much longer to find the right spot where Luke would eventually spawn on my head. But even from there, there wasn't enough room for him just to walk clearly onto the platform. We would actually have to time our walking at the same exact time so that as I fall, Luke can use my head as a makeshift bridge to, to cross ahead onto the upper platform and move forward. But this one took a lot of timing, but we finally did get it. And geez, were we happy when we finally got out of that place. Next, we we're going on to everyone's favorite level, the library, which was actually surprisingly easy. We didn't really have any problems here. And then we're on two betrayals, which is a pretty long level. I mean, usually we just throw ourselves off the tower recklessly, but instead we had to bob and weave all the way down. Later on in the level, there's this ledge that is hard to get up as we can't get on a rock and just climb up like the normal way a player would. So instead, we had to walk all the way back and get on this small rock, and then we had to stand on each other's head and inch our way all the way back over to the cliff. Now, of course, this is a similar strategy to what we did in the Pillar of Autumn level. However, this time it's a much longer walk and there's ice, which essentially means the bottom player is walking at a slower pace than the top player, which is really tricky here because if one of the players is going at a significantly different speed than the other, you fall off and then we have to start all over again. Finally, we made it onto the rock and then we had to use our respawn mapping trick from the last level before finally Luke respawned on my head and was able to walk on to the next area. On the level, hello, my name Keys, it's not actually too hard of a level, pretty similar to Truth and Reconciliation, except the green goo makes it much harder to see because you can't jump to see where you are in the world. And I know I got lost a lot more than Luke did, but trust me, while you see footage of Luke just doing his thing on this level, I was probably lost in the green goo for quite some time. And then we got to one of the hardest levels, the Maw, which we thought would be a completely impossible task, and it was actually really easy. Yeah, we didn't really struggle on it. There's nice ramps that take you up to where you need to go. Sure, you have to backtrack a little bit more because you can't just jump back up to the platform to throw the grenades into the vents. Otherwise, it was a walk in the park. Halo 2 is up next. Starting things off, we jump onto Cairo Station. There was nothing too worrisome on this level. We had to be careful because there's some space parts, and if you walk the wrong way, you could kind of get stuck, but we didn't get stuck, so we're lucky there. Moving through to outskirts, we actually had to play this level normally. Like pretty much every time we play this level, we like to jump across the rooftops. And this was the first time that we can remember in a very, very long time playing through this level the way you're actually intended to by going through the streets and alleyways and doing the firefight at the beginning. We took some time to look at the posters and we actually kind of enjoyed playing through this level the right way for once. However, once you get through Hotel Zanzibar, you can get a ghost and just drive your way to the end of the level easy peasy. Metropolis was another extremely easy level as you just use a ghost and drive straight to the end of the level and you can even drive your ghost on the scarab if you really feel like it. On the Arbiter and the Oracle, you kind of just walk a lot. We did have a mini panic attack when we had climbed our way all the way up to the upper section and there's this little decline at the top of the pillar. We were essentially stuck in this circle that's just a couple inches off of the ground, but fortunately enough, a cutscene activated so we didn't have to worry about anything. And then we get to this epic boss fight where Luke just swords him and we didn't have to worry about jumping or walking in this case. Next, we're going on to Delta Halo, which is much easier when Luke isn't killing me with a rocket launcher, but otherwise we just walked forward until we got to the 
section with the ghost and drove through this level as well. Regret was another level that we were pretty sure we wouldn't have to jump on. We're a little unsure about the boss fight at the end, so we decided to play through it anyways. We forgot how much waiting is involved in this level. We pushed some marines in the water just to kill some time, and that was kind of fun. But otherwise, yeah, you can beat this level without jumping as well as just you get close enough to the prophet, it lets you board him even if you're on the ground. Then we got to Sacred Icon, which actually gave us a few problems along the way. Yeah, we're pretty surprised how much of a walk in the park Halo 2 had been at this point, but of course Sacred Icon had to come up and ruin our day. Now right away, there's this ledge that we had to try to get up onto. You're expected just to jump up there, but it's actually too high to even do the regular respawn head glitch that we did in Halo 1. We could finally get it where we respawned on each other's head, but the ledge was still just an inch too high to just easily walk across. Fortunately enough, however, if we walked over to this little ramp on the side, it could get us just enough momentum to slide through without having to worry about doing any tricks to get up onto the next section. Essentially, it helped us just break through the gap. Now, later on in the level, we ran into more problems in the room after the first gondola, where the door opens up where you're supposed to go through to get in the hallway, where essentially we had to drop on each other's head to get to the first ledge, and then we had to do another respawn trick so we could respawn on each other's head yet again. However, even with this trick, the ledge was still slightly too high to make it up. Fortunately enough, we remembered back to our Halo no walk run that if you give the other player a little bit of a punch, it gives you just enough of a boost, which in this case was just enough that we needed to make it up into the ledge and into the hallway, where we drop down, we're in another hallway, and then there's a bunch of ledges we have to go through. Except this time around, in the first segment of this hallway, the flood is kind of in an infinite respawn loop until you get a little further in the hallway. So we actually had to learn completely how to do the whole respawn mapping that we had learned in Halo 1, which mostly works here as well, but we had to time it in between the flood respawning because essentially the flood comes in and prevents you from being able to do a respawn. Now we could kill the flood, but a lot of the times we wouldn't be placed in the right spot for the other player to respawn on top of the Arbiter's head. So we really had to make sure we were killing the right flood to end the wave before more flood respawned so that the respawn would be perfectly in the corner so we could quickly walk up to the next platform without doing a jump. Fortunately enough, this worked and we're able to drop down breaking the infinite spawn on the flood. However, this room still has more flood spawning in at a little bit of a slower rate and we had to redo similar walk respawn tricks over and over again just to clear this hallway. It was pretty ridiculous. But once finally clearing this area, we see a lot of repeated geometry, the same types of ledges we had seen earlier in the level, which we cleared the same way and this level was good to go as well. Quarantine zone was up next. We were a little nervous about it, but it's actually really easy to complete with a ghost and then you just have a gondola ride at the end and a little walk to get to the sacred icon. Nothing to worry about here. So grave mind was up next. We actually didn't really have any problems until we got to the second outside area towards the end of the level where you have to walk up a ramp to get to the doorway to the next area. However, this ramp is just slightly out of the way. You could probably respawn glitch and find a way around it, but fortunately enough, I was able to get enough momentum on the rocks by just walking down at the bottom. And I just used the rock to walk up the side and then kind of drop onto the platform without having to jump. Otherwise, it's just a straight walk to the end of the level and you just wait for the firefight to end. On Uprising, there were no challenges really here either. Once we got to the ghosts, we knew from our other runs that we could just take them all the way to the very end of the level. So this one was a walk in the park, literally, or a ghost ride through the park. And on High Charity, there's only two major things you have to watch out for. There's a grav lift that lifts you up where you want to make sure you use the momentum to get out of the dish before you get stuck like Luke did. And then later when there's an elevator, you want to make sure you get on the elevator so Luke doesn't intentionally crush you with said elevator. Otherwise, this level doesn't have any challenges. And we saw a similar case with Just OK Journey. There's narrow hallways with all of the enemies that have brute shots, which can be kind of tricky since you can't dodge their shots, but otherwise you can get through this. And once we got to the Banshees, we also knew that we can fly them straight to the final boss with Tartarus and kill Tartarus with them so we wouldn't have to worry about jumping any gaps in the final boss fight. And Halo 2 was also completed without pressing the jump button. And then we're moving on to Halo 3 for all the marbles. Can Master Chief complete this last fight without jumping? And starting off on Sierra 117, there's this ledge right here to teach people how to jump and you don't really have too many options as to what you can do here. However, fortunately enough, after trying for a little bit, we were able to push Luke up on 
onto the rock, which is one hell of a way to start off a no jump run in a Halo game. But we got to another ledge right afterwards, which is just as messed up as before, maybe even worse, as grenade jumping doesn't work in this game either. And we spent a very long time exploring all of the possibilities, trying to figure out anything we could do to get past this next ledge. I tried standing on Luke's head, but the only way to stand on Luke's head was to have him stuck in the crouch position, which would not give us enough traction needed to get the momentum to climb up the hill. And despite everything we had accomplished in Halo 1 and 2, we were pretty sure we were going to have to count this as a jump and just turn this into how few jumps to complete Halo 3 until we noticed this ledge right here and Luke stood on my head and we balanced so carefully and we still couldn't make it up. However, this time we came back with a running start and we actually got it and Luke killed me and I respawned. Then there's another ledge where we thought we were done again and without any additional ledges to help us get on top of each other's head, we thought we were in trouble. So I was just editing this part and actually Elijah recorded something else here because I think our notes were wrong. But what we actually did is there was this little rock and I got on Elijah's head and we walked all the way over and then I made it. However, from there, the rest of the level was pretty simple and we're able to walk through without any major problems. We got onto Crow's Nest, which fortunately enough, Crow's Nest has stairs everywhere like any civilized game design should have. Maybe at this point, Luke and I were a little salty from the time it took us to beat Sierra 117 still. Savo Highway also wasn't a problem at all. When we got to the storm, it was actually pretty straightforward. We were really worried about the scarab and we didn't know how we would be able to get on the scarab without jumping, especially because getting into the back ledge can be a little bit hard. We shot up the legs and Luke used this newly discovered elevator that apparently a lot of you guys always knew existed, but we didn't know about it until a run not too long back and easily just walked onto the scarab and was able to take it out. Then we went on to floodgate and in the foundry section, getting up in the room can be a little confusing, but fortunately enough, there's stairs. At one point, Luke got straight up oofed by a trip mine and the flood architecture is a little jagged, which makes us worrisome for what we're gonna have in the level Cortana later on, but Floodgate was actually relatively easy. Then we're going on to the Ark, which the hardest part of this level was the terrible net code. We're actually really surprised we're able to take out the Scarab with a tank and never even got out of the tank, which wasn't something we knew was even possible. Going to the Covenant, this level is also completely beatable as well without jumping. Of course, there's the part at the end of the level where there's two Scarabs and we pretty much just use the Hornet and very well thrown grenades, mind you, to take out those scarabs. And when you get to the final stretch at the bridge, it can be kind of scary because you can get knocked off so easily. And since we have to walk and not be able to dodge everything that's going on on this bridge, it definitely was a little bit more challenging than when you do a typical playthrough where you can kind of just bounce and hop your way past stuff. Then we got to Cortana. Oh boy. We are able to walk through a large section of this level without having too many problems. However, we got to this part where essentially there's a gap you're supposed to jump across and there really wasn't anything we could do to go around it. We were gonna have to jump here unless we could come up with something crazy like find a random piece of debris and try to push it into a makeshift bridge, which is exactly what we tried to do. This took way longer than ever and we were so terrified we were gonna accidentally knock the debris off and not have it as a bridge. But fortunately enough, it actually held and we were able to use it to cross, which which was really, really an accomplishment. But when it got time to get to the second jump, we didn't have anything like debris laying around that we could use to make a bridge. We thought about going back and getting the debris from the other bridge and trying to push it forward, but the pathway would be too narrow and it would likely fall. After really trying to see what options we had here, we ended up finding the section where Luke could stand on and then he could move onto my head. And if I walked off the edge at the right speed while he walked forward, we could use my head once again as a makeshift bridge where Luke was able to use the height advantage from standing on my head to get enough forward momentum to cross the gap and allowed us to proceed through this level and beat it without jumping. This was the closest call to any run falling apart at the end outside of one other video you guys have probably seen before and we were so excited that this time around we were able to actually follow through and complete it. From here we went on to the level Halo. There's no jump jumping required in this level at all, even though we usually use it to get outside the map and explore and do a bunch of fun stuff, but you can do it, boots on the ground, and Halo 3 was completed along with the entire Halo trilogy without having to sacrifice a single jump. Sure, throughout this run, no jumping obviously is a lot easier maybe on paper than doing something like a no walking run, but honestly, with the way some of these things were set up, 
the obstacles we had to overcome were much harder than a lot of the individual obstacles in other types of runs we had. Yeah, there's a ton of levels you can just breeze right through, but when there are obstacles that come up, you really have to think of different ways to clear them. And that was something we were really proud of at the end of this run. But if you guys like these types of videos and you've watched us for a while, make sure you are subscribed with notifications on. If you could take like just two seconds to double check, it would mean the world to us. And leave a comment if you have any recommendations for other types of videos you'd like to see us cover in the future. That's it for today, and we'll see you guys all next time with a brand new video. Bye guys.